And I left school at the age of 15. And I wanted to be an architect. I clearly remember that. And Lloyd's at the time advertising for apprenticeships, I assume. And I took, and I think I might well have been influenced by my brother-in-law. Uh, my brother-in-law is sort of 16, 17 years older than me, uh, as, as is my sister. And I think he may have influenced in some degree that, that sort of um, getting to this, you know, sort of business. And I think that's how it came about. Went for an interview, went for an examination as it was then, uh, some sort of test. And um, surprisingly, I, I, I became involved there. But it really was a blind jump. It really was a blind jump. And the first 12 months I did at Lloyd's was at Bourne House, which is along the Darleston Road, the road into Darleston, I think it's called the Darleston Road, opposite the, what is now the Church of England Church, and also there's now a mosque there. And Hayes is the car people were next door. I think they, they are on the whole site now. And the first 12 months he spent there, you learn how to make tools and that sort of business, how to use a furnace and all that sort of business, and also the, the academic site. And then you move into the into the into the machine shop as it was then, down on Wednesday on Park Lane. One thing that struck me as being, I know, which I wasn't happy about, I, I I went as an engineer, which is what I thought I was going to be. And when that indentures the legal agreement came through, which was some considerable time later, eighteen months later, it had got me down as a machinist. And there is no way in this world that I was going to be a machinist. I hadn't got the aptitude for it. I don't think I'd got the skill for it, to be fair. I don't think I, I particularly youthful in my hands. I don't think I'd done. And I'd got no intention. And I think that was a, that was a fairly serious knockback. Um, but I was too far in. So it was a matter of continuing that line. And into the machine shop, and you, you went with somebody who had the machine, a father figure. And that was for the next four or five years. Um, and you went from machine to machine to machine. Um, seeing what your aptitude was or wasn't, and mine wasn't very good. Oh, <laughs> no way, no way. And at, towards the end of the apprenticeship, um, I was with a guy on a, a large horizontal border, which is a machine that goes that way, bores a hole that way. And we got a, a large fabrication, and we got to turn the fabrication round to do some work. So the chap's name was Fred Sleeman. He got the chains going that way, and I put the chains going the other way. The consequence was the thing slipped, and my hand got stuck in between. And um, it was resting on two fingers at the bottom of the sharp corner. And I said to the crane driver, a female crane driver, the name of Evelyn, Evelyn, I've got my finger stuck in the chains. You know. No problem, John, I'll take it up. <laughs> consequence was two fingers came out. Um, rushed to the Warsaw General Hospital as it was and fingers were stitched back on and good as new. Um, and f I think if I got any doubts about being a machinist then, that went, <laughs> completely went. And I, I ended up after a few, few more years, ended up in the machine shop office where um, it was, I worked with another guy and our job was to, to, exp to tell customers how much it would cost to machine a casting from 60 tonne to 60 pound. And I stayed there for the next 15, 16 years. So some people look back with Lloyds and, and like any other industry you've been in and say, oh, it was wonderful and it was all rosy. And I don't think it was, to be honest with you. Um, I, I had the good fortune because of the, the previous business life of being senior staff shop steward, of going round the, round the works. And also in the job of, uh, which all ourselves estimators at the time, estimating the cost of castings to machine. I could go around the factory and talk to people and look at things. And the conditions in the fettling shops where people grind the castings was absolutely appalling. It was thick dust, the, the smell was appalling, the dirt was appalling. And in the castings where they knocked the castings out of the mould with the dust and the sand flying everywhere. And then you got water pressure to clean the castings off and all that sort of thing and the grinding of the castings. And it was absolutely awful. People were dying of pneumoconiosis and silicosis. And of course we got our own then medical centre, what was opened by the notorious John Stavnes. He opened the medical centre and it was a, a top of the art range medical centre because of the problems that were there. And, um, and people, I think, tended to forget that side of every industry. And that was prevalent through Lloyd's all, all the while. And um, so 
And it's a shame to say there's no industry in that area. I accept that. But that, that's a God bygone age. And it, it wasn't all roses. There was fun times. Of course, there was fun times. Everybody has fun times. But there really was this underlying seriousness of, of there could be serious accidents. I say, like, my fingers were, were just minor. People died. People had castings fall on them. You know, I remember somebody having the, the, the part of a turret of a tank that we used to make. It actually tipped over and fell across the bloke's stomach killed outright you know and and things like that happened not regular would happen and and accidents happened things fall over you know swarf cut people seriously and and stuff in people's eyes and um that was that was if you like part and parcel but the health and safety gradually increased and gradually improved over the years and that got a long way to go looking backwards but it was it was serious stuff and, and some people look back and say, oh, it was all wonderful and it was smashing. I wouldn't go back there for a fortune. You know, that, that's, that's, it was dirty, serious, hard work. And I don't think people got a lot of money for it. During the early time, when I particularly, when I was, if you like, the shop steward or whatever, um, and when there was a Labour government, I became involved in, I think it was what I called the, it was a government scheme. It was a sector working party for foundries. And you'd meet with other, other managing directors, if you like, from, from other foundries throughout the country. And it became fairly obvious in the, what would it be, the late, se late to mid-70s, that there was a gross overcapacity of steel casting in the, in the, in, in the country. Gross overcapacity. And what the, the government came up with a scheme, which was known as Lazards, which was named after the bank, Lazards, that actually develop the scheme. What the government did was they, they were prepared to pay companies to go out of business. So they could then share the, share the remaining work around the foundries that remained. And they were prepared to say to companies, here's X number of pounds, but you must destroy, you must destroy your furnaces and all your equipment. And people looked around and they said, well, that one will go and that one will go. And that, people picked on sort of half a dozen smaller foundries to go, to leave the bigger ones, uh, Lloyd's and one or two up north, north, north foundries going. And to everyone's surprise, Lloyd's volunteered. L Lloyd's, Lloyd's must have took the, the view that they was a downward spiral and they were only going to lose money, therefore best to take the government's money now and invest it elsewhere. At the time, bear in mind, they got Lloyd's at Parker Foundry in Derby. They got Lloyd's Burton. They got AC and JK. And they'd got one in Davitt and, and Hingley's at Netherton. It was a fairly large group. And they got other, other organisations other than steel castings. Um, they were made the, the rolling tracks for, for tanks and stuff like this and the couplings for, for trains and things like that. So I think what the intention was was to collect the money and invest it in the other side subsidiaries. It never quite worked that way, but no less, they, they took the money. And in the late 70s, 75 onwards, you could see the work dropping off. There was no question about that. There was less requirements for British steel foundry casting because you could buy it cheaper from abroad. There's no question about that. Um, whatever reason it was, the, the, it was cheaper to import rather than go homegrown. Uh, whether that was investment or not, I don't know. Uh, Lloyd's in, invested in the machine shop, there's no question about that. Um, but the fact of life was there was less work around and it was clearly going down. And you could see it going down. You could see it moving. Hence the reason most of us in the machine shop office were reallocated out to other parts of the company. And they took the money and they closed it down. The unfortunate part was that where they wanted to invest it into, that also went down. That also went down. So Lloyd's shrank from, I think Lloyd's wrote, about 2,000 people worked in the Wednesby site. That just shrank to absolutely nothing. And um, it, it just went completely, uh, along with everything else in that area. Um, but the other subsidiaries went as well. Hingley's went and all the rest went. Um, so that's, that's how it actually ended. So I, I was about the last but one trench. It, it dwindled down after I went. There was a first big trench of people going. Then I went, and then it, it, gradually, it gradually dropped off. 